Welcome back. We're going to talk about audition, which is another word for hearing. So hearing is another wave-based sense. Vision had been a wave-based sense, right, where incoming waves determine the color and the intensity. Um, audition is exactly the same way. As uh, waves move through the air, they cause sound waves. As, as sounds move through the air, they cause sound waves. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Um, and again, the, the wavelength is going to be one important dimension, and then the wave amplitude is going to be the other important di dimension. So pitch is determined by um, wavelength. So low frequency sounds, the ones that are represented by the bass speakers, um, those are going to create you know, longer waves. So higher pitch sounds are going to create the higher frequency waves, and so you get the you know the tweeters and things like that to represent the high frequency sound waves. So um, just like vision, we've got these sound waves, and then um, we also have just like the intensity of the of the visual stimulus is determined by amplitude, the intensity of the auditory stimulus is determined by amplitude. In in audition, we call that volume. So a high amplitude sound is louder than a low amplitude sound. Um, you know, some stereos can go up louder and handle, you know, higher amplitude sounds. Some are quieter. Um, some people's ears need higher amplitude sounds to detect pitches, right, because we're starting to have hearing damage, things like that. Um, so same kind of um, system. It's just that now we're talking about the waves hitting our um, auditory sense receptors. So oh, this is an old ad from the olden days. That guy's Primo stereo is blowing him out of his chair because it could do such high amplitude sound as opposed to a whisper, right, which is a low amplitude sound. So let's talk about the ear. And I'm not sure why our textbook can, um, depicts the ear as purple zombie ear, but okay. Um, so here we have sound waves coming into the um, auditory canal. And what we're looking at is the outer ear. This is the part of your ear that can be seen from the outside, so creatively named the outer ear. And it's made up of the pinna, which is the part that actually, you know, sticks out of our head. And it has all these convolutions because those actually help to funnel the sound waves down our auditory canal. Uh, so they're, they're actually there for a purpose. And the orientation of our pinna relative to our head is on purpose also to make sure that the sound waves are going down our auditory canal. Um, it helps us to locate sounds and things like that. So these are what we call pinna. Some of you have pierced pinna. Some of you don't. Um, most, some of you can wiggle your pinna. Most of us can't. Um, your dog, your cat, they can move their pinna, right, to locate sounds. The auditory canal is the, the long tube that goes from your pinna all the way up to your um, eardrum. So the, uh, the outer ear ends at the eardrum. Um, so as the, as the sound wave goes down the auditory canal, you see that it gets kind of compressed as it goes into that smaller space. And then it has this um, effect on the eardrum that causes it to rattle. And that, the timing of that rattling of the eardrum is going to help to convey the sound into our um, sound receptors. All right, so all of this is outside. Now the eardrum requires lubrication to stay flexible. It's just sort of like skin. And uh, so we secrete earwax to lubricate our eardrums. Some of us have drier earwax than others of us, and so sometimes we want to, you know, like clean it out, stuff like that. It turns out that it, one of the worst things that you can do is to shove the earwax deeper into your ear canal. Um, it can cause it to dry out and compact in there, and you can end up dampening your hearing and actually cause ear pain. Um, so it's really important that you not clean your ears any deeper than, you know, you can see into it because nobody can see it anyway. Um, it, you want to let it just sort of naturally flood out. If you have a lot of accumulation of earwax, there are, are flooding things that you can do, little balls of um, like water kind of substance that you put in there, let it sit, and then um, drain out and stuff. You don't want to Q-tip it, in other words, because you can compact the earwax down and make really big problems. Um, so that's my little soapbox on the Q-tip. I'm not anti-Q-tip. I'm just anti-Q-tip all the way in. The middle ear is that section from the 
eardrum, from the inside of the eardrum up to that bluish structure that looks kind of like a snail. <laughs> so um, all the things in between. So that open air area, and then there are three little bones in the middle ear. They're the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Some of you may have taken a um, biology class and you were told the official name for the for each of those bones. I can't remember them. All I remember is stapes for the stirrup, but in psychology, we like to go with the everyday words. So we just call them the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Um, the air space in your middle ear connect your middle ear to your eustachian tube. Your eustachian tube connects your middle ear to your mouth. And um, in babies, that eustachian tube is really short. And so um, bacteria from their mouth can get up into the eustachian tube and cause ear infections. Um, so babies are really prone to ear infections because of that short eustachian tube. Um, you shouldn't let them you know, drink bottles laying down and things like that because it can pool in their eustachian tube and cause a, a middle ear infection. The reason why we worry about middle ear infections is because bacteria like to grab onto things and um, use them as like a place to breathe from. And as they hold on to whatever they've held on to, they can deteriorate it. And so you could lose your th you, one of the three um, tiny bones. They can eat right through that. Um, they can eat through the cochlea, which is that blue snail-like structure, and cause the water to come out. They can cause your eardrum to rupture. So bacteria is no good for our hearing. And so we want to try and prevent ear infections and absolutely treat them if somebody gets one. Um, the inner ear is that blue snail-like structure. So um, those parts that are sticking out looking like the antenna of the snail, those are your semicircular canals. And they're not actually relevant to hearing. We'll come back to the semicircular canals when we talk about balance. What we're going to talk about um, with regard to hearing is the cochlea. The cochlea is to hearing as the retina is to vision. They, if you think about it like that, they're both the final collector of the information that then is going to pass it on to the brain using, in this case, the auditory nerve instead of the optic nerve and vision. So they're very analogous to if you compare the, the retina and the cochlea. They work very similarly. They collect information that first was conducted to us using waves, and um, they are the structures that actually interpret that information and ca cast it up to the brain. So let's look at that cochlea. So clearly this cochlea has been stretched out a little bit so we can see the tube. It's a tube that's filled with water and lined with hairs. And um, those hairs are going to get stimulated by the fluid that's, going past, that's being moved by the, the sound waves. And those hair cells are going to actually interpret the frequency of the sound. Here's a nice zoom in on what those hair cells along the cochlea look like. Now, kind of surprisingly for me when I found this out, um, the, co the hair cells that are closest to the source of sound, like the beginning of sound, is your highest pitch frequency hair receptors. Every single time a sound comes by, those hair receptors get stimulated and they have to recognize, no, that doesn't matter to me. No, that doesn't matter to me. Oh, here's a high-pitched one, okay, I'll respond. They're the first ones to lose their sensitivity. So by the age of 18, your ability to detect the highest frequency sound that you ever you had been able to do younger. By the age of 18, you've lost the highest pitch. Um, by 25, you've lost the next highest pitch. Um, by the age of 40, you're down another layer. So that by the time you're in middle age, you've lost a lot of the really high-pitched frequencies that might have used to really annoy you when you were younger. Like um, London uses a really high-pitched frequency to keep teenagers from loitering around the bus stops because it just drives them crazy because they can hear it. Um, and older people, I think it's um, 18 and over, they can't really hear it. And so it doesn't bother them to stand there and wait for the bus. But a younger person, it just they're like, oh, it's so painful and aversive. I don't want to go stand and wait for the bus. Um, so we can kind of use that against uh, uh, younger people. It's a problem. Us older people can't hear a lot of the higher sounds. So that's annoying. But um, now in this picture, you see the auditory nerve, which is going to go off to the brain and carry the information of intensity and frequency up to the brain for processing. Now, I thought I'd share with you a little bit about um, damaging those hair cells. It turns out this is a, a chart that was produced by a um, 
by OSHA. OSHA's job is to make sure that you're not getting harmed at work. Um, it's occupational safety hazard something. Um, and what they've determined is that if you are exposed to 85 decibels chronically for eight hours a day for five days a week, you could face hearing loss. So they say that, you know, a workplace either needs to provide you with hearing protection or, you know, put you out of range of that high of decibel. Um, that's only slightly louder than the sort of noise you'd expect at a busy street corner. Um, if you worked in the subway train tunnels, you're looking at, you know, way above what could be damaging to you. If you play in a rock band, you're, play, you're looking at way above what could damage you. Um, if you look at this chart, it's what we call logarithmic. So um, 0 to 10 is 10 times less than the 10 to 20 difference. So it goes really fast. Um, so 85 decibels is our cutoff point. The 140, that's enough to damage your hearing in one exposure. Um, so 140 is um, the, a serious, sorry, being disturbed by my phone. Um, so the 40 decibels is, is, could damage you in one exposure. So we want to be really careful about things like that. If you're going to go to a, um, to a concert, You've probably already noticed this. If you've been to a loud concert, you, the next day your ears are ringing really hard. That's because you've overstimulated those hair receptors and they're trying to recover. Um, when you're younger, you probably can recover, but you know, do that a few times and you're going to really actually damage your hearing. Um, so you go to a rock concert with earplugs in. You'll still hear it. It just won't damage your hearing. Um, one of the most damaging things that people today are doing is listening to earbuds chronically and too loud. Um, so one of the best things that you could do is crank down your volume. And maybe don't use earbuds. You'll notice, see what I'm wearing? I've got um, aftershocks, they're called. And they're not, they're not, they don't go in my ear at all. They're actually conveying sound through my bones. So I'm not going to damage my hearing, even if I were to crank this up loud, which I don't because it actually vibrates and it feels really weird if you have it up too loud. Uh, so it actually conducts sound directly to my bones, which is a clearer, richer, more resonant sound, and it doesn't hurt my ears. I'm, not, I'm never going to damage my ears as long as I'm delivering it like this. And in fact, what you can do with these aftershocks is put plugs into your ears so that other sounds around you don't damage your hearing, or if you want noise counseling or something like that. I don't like stuff in my ears anyway, so I really like these aftershocks. Um, but it's a pretty nice way to avoid the possibility of damaging your hearing. Because what we're finding is that there's been a spike in hearing damage, hearing loss among 18 to 44-year-old adults. 18 to 44-year-old adults should still have really good hearing. And what we're finding is that um, people who use headphones heavily, 23% of them are experiencing hearing loss. And you can't get it back. Once you damage those hair cells, they're dead. You cannot get them back. Um, so you want to protect them so that when you get older, you can hear. So do everything you can to protect those ears. Now, why do you have two ears, one on either side of your head? Um, well, it helps you to localize sound. You've got your eyes for recognizing where it's coming from, if it's in front of you, or if it's behind you. You can always assume, well, I can't see it. It must be behind me. But to be able to tell whether it's coming from your right or left, it's really handy having an ear on either side of your head. Because whichever ear collects the information first, your brain processes that and knows to look to the right in the case of this bell. right? So um, our ears are on the two sides so we can know right from left. We already know whether it's in front of us because we have eyes. Um, where it gets tricky, though, is this center area when it's hitting both ears at the same time. Because if I can't see it, that means it's either above me or behind me. Now, ancestrally, you know, the way that we've evolved, it's probably behind us, right? But today, there are things that can be above us that didn't used to be able to be above us as, um, you know, our ancestors. So we end up looking like this, trying to figure out, where is that coming from? I don't see it in front of me. I look behind me. It's above me somewhere. <laughs> so we end up looking like these dogs, trying to figure out, where is it? Um, we don't have to turn our heads like that usually because our ears are actually a little offset. That's why our glasses are always crooked until they fix it at the uh, eye doctor. 
Um, our ears are a little offset, so that even helps us to figure out not only left versus right, but a little bit you know above and below. Um, so our ear placement is really deliberate, right, to make sure that we're actually getting the best information we can. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a break here, and I will wrap up the last three senses all in one. So I will be back. <laughs> 